The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. But a lot of people who are mature enough, old enough for not doing their due diligence to even attempt to obey the principles of the Father, that some sort, some sort of example would be shown to everybody else to bolster one's attention concerning God. You see an absolute removal of that and in place of that, what you see are the elder folks fighting like cats and dogs, vicious, trying to save their old ideas. This is how the young see it. They're trying to save their old ideas that are dying out. They're not working. And meanwhile, they're self-destructing and taking everybody else with them. That does give Christians an opportunity. Don't you think about something? The older people say, we have to reestablish this country as we had it before. The younger people say, hey, you, you did it your way, and all you do is end up fighting one another. We don't want that, we want something else. But the Christians should believe, should know, hey, this is an opportunity for us to step out on faith and represent the kingdom of God, to demonstrate what unity is, because they can't do it. They can't do it. Leadership, they cannot demonstrate what unity is. They can't. The Democrats are falling apart. The Republicans are falling apart. Everybody seems to be falling apart. They're communicating things to people. For example, many people right now in the news are upset, right? Certainly, Biden should have built something with a wall, right? Truth is, he can't. But hardly anybody knows that. They don't know the differences between presidential powers and congressional powers. They don't know that. So the public is demanding things of a, of a position that that position has no power to grant. You know what that does? It makes people angry. It's happening on both sides. It really is. Isn't that funny? Something that uh, we should have done a long time ago, to be truthful. Because none of you would leave your front door open, windows wide open, and go to sleep and rest peacefully. You lock your front doors, right? Everybody locks their front doors. But the fact is, no president has authority to do that. Congress does. Now, Congress, they sit up there, well, people don't know that. But what are they doing? What are they doing? You don't know what they're doing, do you? You don't know. The thing that gets me is they allow someone to take the blame without saying anything. What congressman ever came to the microphone and said, hey guys, a president does not have individual powers. That seat does not have powers to do that. Nobody has said that. Why won't they do that? I'll tell you why. Because all this drama and everything else you see, they're counting on it. It's just drawing people in to what you see happening in order to install into this world what they have always desired to install. You need to have a large group of people believe that leadership and government and the ways of old have totally failed. Thus, you install something brand new. Sounds like the beast kingdom, doesn't it? Right now, people don't believe in the old system. You have some people that come out and say, hey, we need to teach patriotism from youth. But that's going to be fought tooth and nail. Simple, truthful history will do that. The problem is we have invited many ideologies into this country and the majority has now changed it is very different you have people divisive people on all sides who will try to start by themselves from everything that's happening everything that's printed in mainstream media is not trusted by a lot of people they have no power to change anything you do you represent what's on the way the world itself is collapsing you guys represent the true change now, but I ask you this, how many of you, if you could, you would begin to involve yourself in that change? Or, how many can't do that? In other words, what I'm saying is your life is so tied up right now, you can't do that. You can't do that. You put too much and everything at risk, and it's not really worth it, because they won't hear you anyway. If you think you're by yourself in that thought, you're not. You're not by yourself. Lots of people like that. But a kingdom is coming. Something before our father's kingdom. Now, because I just talked to you about the western side of things. What about the other side? The side in the Middle East. Why in the world are they beginning to operate unified? And we're operating under heavy division. Can you all see a, a upset in the palace of power? How things have become so corrupt. No waters are smooth. No. Yet the Middle East is beginning to unify. And the sand beast, well, he's on his way. And this, by the way, somebody said America's weak. Yeah, we are weakened in a big degree. You know why we're weakened? We have not sown anything 
of truth with enthusiasm into most children. Children are raising themselves. How many of you know that already? They are raising themselves. Can they look to the news for a good example? No. What do they see? Not to be blunt with you guys, but how in the world on national television will they even allow name calling? Have we really dropped to that level? Because the rest of the world is looking at us and they're going to take full advantage. It's unfortunate that we're not going to know any better until we're burning. We won't do anything until we're burning. Listen to me. I'll say it again. We're not going to do a thing until we're burning. We're going to have to burn first. We're going to have to be awakened. Right now, people have their own ideas, and they cannot hear anybody else's interjections. They're going to do what they want to do. They're going to do it their way, and they tell you every single day. Each group will tell you they are the best at what they do. But when you have one group who's good at doing one thing and another group who's good at doing the opposite, you're going to have a fight, a struggle. And what does our father say? A house divided against itself. Can anybody finish that? Shall not stand. A house divided against itself shall not stand. Now that's different from everything else. I mean, think about it. If you say a house divided against itself will not stand, that means somehow it's not going to be strong enough, it's going to fall apart. If you say a house divided against itself cannot stand, that means it's not going to maintain enough strength to stay upright and eventually it's going to fall. But when you say a house divided against itself shall not stand, that is the decree from the Most High. That is His word against a divided house. My, my. I'll say it again. That's His word against a divided house. See, God is a God of unity. He does not like division. And a house divided against itself shall not stand. See, that's a declaration. And what's happening to us? Those of you in the U.S. and Germany and the U.K., what's happening to us? We're falling apart. And it's almost like nobody can put it back together. We're falling apart. Everybody has been trying, but it's falling. More and more is falling. See, that means we're in a bit of trouble. But I'll tell you something. The moment a country who stood on the values of the Word of God, the moment they cast it away. Because, see, we used to hold the value system of the living God. We did. People used to know the U.S. as those who had the Ten Commandments. It was so prominent that the Islamic folks who were building their forces back up and building everything back up, they used to write about that, about the USA. I find that to be amazing. They knew it. They knew we had the Ten Commandments posted in every state. We used to pray in school. We had prayer in school. We had the knowledge, the blessings. We did. We had it. We were the youngest country on earth who stood on the value system of the Lord when we lost it. And now we are backing up from enemies all over the world. Our society is turned upside down. And this is one of those do or die years. We'll either be victorious or not. I know that if Christians do not stand and be a perpetual example, all is lost. Because just like last night, a country is a country because of the people, not because of the dirt, but the people. When the people start changing, the country is different. When you have the majority of the people who have totally discarded the Bible, I'll say the numbers don't support us as being a nation who is turning wholly to God. You'd think we'd learn this from all these fallen kingdoms out there. The Lord's way will take place. All right, we're going to read in Revelation 18. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. The earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried, mightily with a strong voice saying Babylon the great has fallen is fallen and has become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird I find that odd every unclean and hateful bird that seems to be the number one thing growing among people hatred this bitterness and envy jealousy all sorts of things are building for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. I heard another voice from heaven saying, 
come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Let me pause. Come out of her, my people. Now this is, listen, he heard an angel saying this. Well, let's say he heard a voice saying this. Come out of her, my people. You mean to tell me God's people are there? Yes, they are. Uh-oh. See, did you guys miss that? Where are God's people at? Right in the middle of her. Right in the middle of who? Babylon. God's people are in Babylon. In the middle of who? Babylon. They're in the midst of Babylon. And God is calling his children out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Listen, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So that means not only are God's people in it, but they're in it and partakers of her sins. And just how many sinful things are we actually involved in with? God says, love your enemy, correct? That's what he says. Who taught everybody to hate their enemy? Not your father. Uh-oh. Oops. Did I say that? Your father did not teach any of us. He didn't teach me. He didn't teach you how to hate your enemy. He didn't. No, he didn't. Who taught you that? Men did. Man taught you how to hate your enemies. Man did that. Not your father. Your father said through Christ, love your enemies. But the, but the world, in the various ideologies of this world, what do they say? Hate your enemy. Hate your enemy. How do they say it? Do they just outright say, hate your enemy? No. No. They point your attention to people, and they say, hey, they're stealing everything you have. They're taking everything. This is all countries. Not just the USA. And this is all countries. Hey, they're corrupting your heritage. Hey, they're doing this. Hey, they're doing that. They blame. They pinpoint. They accuse. And if you believe their words over your father's, you're going to feel just like they do. Thus, you're going to be a partaker of her sins. Is it a sin to know what the father told us and not do it? You better believe it. That's called disobedience. God's people are found all over the earth. And if you're partaking of the sins of the place that you're in, you will partake of the plagues that come upon it. And no one will escape that. Let's continue. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she has rewarded you, and double unto her a, a, a double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her the double. So give her back double. For she has messed up and corrupted. It's not going to be good for her, right? But who is the her thing? We learned last night there is no uncorrupted place on the face of this earth. It's not here yet. The New Jerusalem is not here yet. It is untainted, sinless. God is in the process of redeeming us and these lands. Right? Us and the collection of places. But, but, right now they're not holy. They're unholy. They do everything that's, a, that's almost like a, a, a trademark of Lucifer himself. One of the biggest ones is accusation accuser. You know what Jesus said? He said, the will of your father you will do. So whoever your father truly is, your real father, your real spiritual father, because he told them, he said, your father is the devil because you seek to kill me. And he said, the will of your father you will do. So whatever you truly claim as your father, you're going to find yourself doing the will of that individual, whoever it may be. If it is God the Father, you're going to do according to God the Father. If it's not, you're going to do according to whatever it is. Jesus said that, the will of your Father you will do. We do that every day of our lives. Don't feel bad. It's an evaluation tool. It really is because your heart is not in evil. Here, here's the problem. You, you come from your Father. You believe in Christ. But the only thing you have seen, what's been proven to you, is the world. You grew up in the world. The world is your comfort. And God has to break that comfort or you'll never be free. That's the number one reason why we cannot have our comfort in this world. Because if we keep that comfort, it's going to cause us to trust in the things of this world more than those things of God. By conversation, you can hear people, they love the Lord, right? But when you look at your life, you know and I know that what the Lord spoke was true. Whatever we claim as our Father, we're doing the will of. Every day of your life, you do the will of something you believe in. Every day. So the question is, what is it you truly believe in? I know, I know, I know. 
as one of those. Uh, I don't want that one. Let's continue. It says, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. You guys remember the terms from last night? Did anybody highlight those portions of Ezekiel 16? Because you're going to hear those same descriptions again, again. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. That's almost a direct quote, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Boy, that's, a, that, that's right there. But listen, what I wanted to show you last night was the sinful part of the specific nation we discussed last night. It's just like Babylon. Babylon has the exact description of the fallen part of all nations. Do you all see that? That Babylon has traits of all the nations. And if you look in the book of Daniel, you'll find there are only four kingdoms. And all four kingdoms are Babylon in four different eras, four different blocks of time. Lord have mercy. Not just one place. A lot of people used to say, well, Babylon's America. Well, Babylon is the Babylon, Iraq. Well, Babylon is this. No, 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 no. Babylon is the sinful portion of this world. The holy portion of this world is the kingdom of God. The sinful portion of this world and the kingship and the rule of man and everything else is Babylon. So that woman that sits atop the beast who has mystery Babylon on her forehead is very special. And what you're seeing in Revelation is her redemption above everybody else's. You better believe. See, because when the world is redeemed, it's going to become what? What's the name of the world in a redeemed state? Somebody. What's the name of the world in a redeemed state? It's not the fallen Jerusalem, and it's not Babylon, the kingdom of God. The world in a redeemed state is the kingdom of God. The world in a fallen state is Babylon. So what is the world when it fights against the living God? What state is that? The war state. When they actually fight against the living God. When they fulfill their gathering together to fight the living God. What is that? That's their God Magog state right before judgment. Do you see that? We have a fallen state. What is our fallen state? We're going to read about that. Our fallen, the fallen side of us. The fallen state, the fallen condition of us, God has already named. Oh, by the way, Satan can only use the fallen condition of you. He cannot use the redeemed portion in any way. Do you know that? Satan cannot use that. So if you walk in obedience, you cannot be used by Satan. When you walk in disobedience, you can. And the Bible says we were once children of disobedience, worthy of death. Didn't he say that? He did. The Lord, he came that we may have life so that we could be redeemed and have that life more abundantly so that your redemption process beginning right here, right now, continues all the way to eternity and beyond so that you would be fully redeemed. Here on this earth, though, in this physical realm, what you're witnessing is a process. You're seeing the sinful portion of all things being separated from the redeemed portion. You feel it in your own in your own minds, in your own hearts. Is there not a, a war inside of you? Even even those who are committed to Christ, there's still a war. There's still a war. There's still times where things rise up. It's a war. Let's continue. So her plagues, they come in one day. Death, mourning, and famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. Stop. Listen. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. What, what does that mean? That means the kings of the earth are separate from Babylon. Uh-oh. See, now we're going to get somewhere. Those kings of the earth who fornicated with... No, okay. If you're the king of a place, how can you fornicate with... It, that's, that's crazy, right? You have to be extra to fornicate. 
You can't be the one of the same entities. That just means you're corrupted. But to actually fornicate means you're separate. So then the kings of the earth, come on, this is important, especially since we have an election year, right, right here, right now. The kings of the earth, do they have to be slaves to Babylon, to this corrupt, sinful place? No, they don't. See, they have an opportunity. You cannot be a king without God's intervention these days. You can't do it. You have to have something on you to be a king in the first place or a president. And contrary to popular belief, you cannot be a president without the father's intervention. They're given an opportunity because every time you see these guys go up before that podium, they can say the truthful thing of which nobody's going to like them or they can lie so that everything can be easy for them. They've got to make a choice, don't they? You remember Jesus said, submit yourselves to earthly authority. Now, why would he ever say that knowing that earthly authority is corrupted? Why would he ever say to any of us, submit yourselves to earthly authority? And he even mention the governors and everything else. He even mentioned the magistrates and everything else. Why would he ever say that? Why would he ever say, submit yourselves to earthly authority? When that authority in the earth is highly corrupted. Why would he say that? Submit yourselves to earthly authority. Well, in the book of Daniel, we learned by King Nebuchadnezzar's issue that he had that God appoints kings. God does that. We saw God's intervention with King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. We saw how Daniel did not compromise. Thus, he was used as a vessel for King Nebuchadnezzar. But not only that, but to establish and free all of his people. We saw that. Until they rebelled, of course, they went right back into bondage. But we see the intervention. We also see a change in heart in King Nebuchadnezzar because of Daniel. Uh-oh, now, now we're getting somewhere. Because of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar had a change in heart. Because of Daniel, God began to work with King Nebuchadnezzar. Because of Daniel. Remember what he was doing? Throwing sh what about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What about Baal? What about all these things that were happening in the earth? What about the, the, the almost a full decimation of those who would be appointed to be Israel at that time, God's holy people? They were absolutely being killed. Great numbers. King Nebuchadnezzar. God intervened. He became king. He became king. And almost immediately upon Daniel being appointed, the king was unsettled started having dreams and if you look carefully in the book of daniel you'll see that what god did in king nebuchadnezzar you know what he did he used king nebuchadnezzar as a mechanism for the deliverance of his own people do you know that now was king nebuchadnezzar was he a believer in god was he faithful was he honorable to god no he believed in the rule of law that's what he believed in. kings of the earth right now you're about to be appointed yet again. But you're just like Daniel. All the believers are just like Daniel. So let me ask you something. What's the difference between you all and Daniel? Is there a big difference? Anybody? Is there a big difference? Was he advantaged? And maybe he could do things differently? What was the case? Is there a difference? Of course there is. You have Christ. He did not. And because you have Christ. And he did not. But he was still used as a vessel. You can do so much more. But it depends on what? What does it depend on? Your obedience. If Daniel were disobedient, and it was not, if he were disobedient, God would not have used him. God would have cut him off right there, Johnny, on the spot. They were still human beings, just like you and I. But they chose to obey the Lord. If we choose to obey the Lord, we're going to be used by the Father for the kings of this earth, kings, plural, of this earth. But we have to be in our positions. In fact, he already said he would do that. Here's the problem. The problem is, are we unified as Christians? I'll go ahead and say it. No, we're not. We're not unified. We allow things of flesh to get in between us being unified. We allow things of flesh to separate us from one another. We could be unified in the word of God, but we're allowing ways of flesh to separate us. The apostles, they were unified. They did not see eye to eye on more than a few things, but they were one. Anyway, so the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously, whither shall bewail her and lament her, when well, they shall see the smoke of her burning 
that's a promise. So you're going to see the smoke of burning. So the kings of the earth, right? The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with a style bewailer. Now you know why they're bewailing her. To live deliciously with someone is to live by way of profit. They got exactly what they wanted out of her. The kings of the earth. Now it didn't say the people of the earth. It's talking about the kings of the earth are going to bewail her. In other words, oh, no more of that. I won't be able to do that anymore. So here is telling you that the kings of the earth who committed fornication with her truly enjoyed the returns. They truly enjoyed the returns. To commit fornication in this context is to forego what you have in you naturally for the sake of something else. It's like having a husband or a wife. You forego your spouse for something else. And we all know what happens if you continue to do that. You're going to forsake your spouse. In this case, they did the same thing. Their fornication caused them to miss her when she was burning. One thing is for sure, she will burn. Oh, but God promised that all idols in all lands are going to go up in smoke. Not one. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. Prosperously. Right? With her, they lived with her. They lived with her. You know, when you live with someone, that means you know the corruption of that person. You know everything about them. If it's against our father to mingle with that person, then that person is corrupt. Here it says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. So they liked it because of profit. Let me ask you guys something. What would happen if money were taken out of the system right now? No more money. What would change? If there was no more money, if everybody lived a different life and there was no more money and to be sustained only required standard work, you know, the work you do in the fields, this, that, and the other, and there's no more money, nobody can run out and get money and be kinged because of money, what would happen? Well, let's go ahead and break it down. Let's, let's go ahead and break it down. Here, here's the problem. Here's the problem. I'm going to rush to this one. Here's the problem. A long time ago, the kings of the earth were not selected by how much money they had. They were not selected by being successful in a business, in a, in, in something like, or coming from some privileged family or something like that, or being in the, you know, they weren't selected that way. They were raised to be kings. Do you know that? They were raised. Listen, when they were raised, we're talking about high discipline here. We are. Even King Nebuchadnezzar had to go through some junk. So that means, first of all, because of all of King, King Nebuchadnezzar was like Saddam Hussein, Hitler, right? And all these different tyrants mixed in together. But what's the one thing reading in the book of Daniel King Nebuchadnezzar never did? He never did what? Two things he never did. Anybody know what that was? Did King Nebuchadnezzar ever lie? No, he would not. Did King Nebuchadnezzar ever disobey the rule of law? No, he did not. That's called integrity. So you had these kings back then. He was a tyrant. He, he would kill entire nations, bloodthirsty, and his decrees were finite. But he did not lie, and he did not go against the, the rule of law. He followed the rule of law, even to the point of his own exile, or death, or his best friend's death. He had integrity. So when you are rotten like he was, by standards of holiness, he was far better than anybody on the face of the earth ruling a kingdom right now because he never lied. And he followed the rule of law. And he made everybody else follow the rule of law. Oh, and he was straightforward. He was transparent. He had no hidden agendas. He didn't do any of those things. So he was not deceitful. But he was a tyrant. He was one nasty guy. Did you guys see? Did you read about Napoleon? All these guys, I think he was probably one of the last ones. They were all the same way. They had high integrity. King Darius, did he lie? Nope. Did he follow the rule of law? Yes, he did. They had integrity. Let me ask you this. Name me any leader on earth in the last 20 years who does not lie. Name one. You can't. Somebody name me one leader that doesn't lie. Please, one, just one, just one. Who? You can't name one. Name me one leader who follows the rule of law to the letter. Name one. Good. Name one. Just one. One. You can't. So 
to, in today's world, we have people who are tyrants. We do. We have some people who are you know, they just, you know, hidden tyrants, but they side skirt the rule of law. They have secret agendas, right? The secret agendas. Somebody said, you, Mike, are you kidding? Did somebody just say, I, I, I didn't lie? No. If I were to say I didn't lie, I'd be lying to you, right to your face. You ever on the phone with somebody and somebody says, hey, Mike, hey, hey buddy, how you doing? You say, I'm doing pretty good. But truth is, you're not. That's a lie, isn't it? That's not being straightforward. It may be petty. It's still a lie, isn't it? If I tell you guys, hey, I'm going to get a page up for you guys in two days, right? And the whole thing blows up, but it's not up two days. That's still a big bogus one. Yes, it was unfortunate, but it was still a big one, correct? Okay, so no, I don't qualify. What I'm telling you is that these kings would rather die than to do that. Do you hear me? They would rather die. You could see that in the stories. I find that to be truly amazing. They had a whole different type. They were, they were different types of people back then. Today, they are deceitful. They'll say one thing and do another. King Nebuchadnezzar did not do that if he said something. Not only did he bind himself to it, but he bound everybody else by it. And everybody else knew it. If it was messed up, then it was messed up. But he would not. He would not sign script. You know when the Lord says there is none righteous, no, not one? <laughs> there we go. I know it's hard for people to admit that they're not quite there yet. Listen, we'll be perfected when we're out of this flesh. Until then, we have to fight the good fight of faith and be highly thankful for Christ. But let's make no, let's not make a big thing about it. In today's world, many people do not have high integrity. I know a lot of Christians who do have high integrity. In fact, I can start naming them right off my hand. And I highly respect them because of how they keep the word, because of their own fight and personal integrity, because of their continuance with the word of the Lord. And I know that even without money, these guys will still continue to go forward despite what anybody thinks. My hat's off to them. But I fight tooth and nail, yes. I fight tooth and nail to go forward with the word of the Lord. I don't care who sees or don't see. I don't care if I get credit or not. I don't like credit. But I don't, you know, I'm going to still go forward for the Lord. But without Christ, I'm doomed. That's what I want you to know. And with these kings in this earth, boy, they're in trouble. Many of them, are, they're just in, they're troublesome. So we have established something. These kings of today lie. They side skirt the rule of law. They have plans of deceit everywhere. They have very low integrity. And here in Revelation, we're seeing it. They lived deliciously with her. Let's say prosperously. They lived prosperously with her. So long as they got something in return, they continued to put up with, with whatever they were dealing with. In this case, that means, if, just in case you didn't catch it, that means if it says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her, then that means she is an entity on her own. Follow me close on this. The rule of law gave life to something beyond mankind. Leaders can come and go, but the rule of law remains. The idea of the rule of law remains. By the rule of law, people are appointed or not. But the rule of law remains. It just so happens that that rule of law in the earth is not by holy men. No, it's just by men. It's not from the living God. It's by men. And what they have done was they created something that will outlive them. So regardless of a, of a good king or a bad king, of a U.S. president, a Russian president, the rule of law remains. Haven't you noticed? And the rule of law is corrupted. And the rule of law allows corruption, doesn't it? And it has a life of its own because it can outlive all administrations, can't it? And it also causes other people to uphold it and to punish those who won't, doesn't it? So, so they have given life to something that can now cause them to bow, didn't they? The only thing missing is to give that rule of law a voice. No wonder in the kingdom of the beast, when he gives life unto the image of the beast, that it would kill anybody that would not worship it punishment for not adhering to a law, the rule of law, a changed rule of law, a corrupted rule of law, something that demands, something that does not have to explain itself. Oh boy, that's a can of worms. And that rule of law is embedded in these kingdoms, and kings appointed over these kingdoms must adhere to that rule of law. Now many of them have become fat because they know how to work and side skirt the rule of law. The rule of law, by the way, is corrupted. It is highly corrupted. And if you know all about the rule of law, like you're an attorney, a lawyer, prosecutor, attorney, something like that, right? You know how to weave in and out of the rule of law. You know who knows what and who doesn't. Imagine that. 
Imagine the rule of law having a voice beyond the judges. There'll be no need for a judge to tell you that this rule of law stands in this case or not. It can do it itself. Then at that point, if anybody has an infraction with the rule of law, they're, they're toast. So if in the rule of law, it states that you cannot commit treason. Uh-oh. Oh, oh boy. We're in trouble. Somebody says, Michael, does Jerusalem increase power over the whole world when trampled underfoot under the beast system so that the destruction of her in Revelation 18 is description loss of all trace? I, you know what? No, I think that happens to the whole world. I do. Listen, here's, here's, here's my, this is just my belief. The trampling of Jerusalem underfoot is important. Now, the beast does this to Jerusalem, correct? He didn't do it anywhere else. You always wonder why. Why didn't he do it anywhere else? Why is nowhere else really mentioned? Why is that emphasis always with Jerusalem? Jerusalem is the standard for all of us. Jerusalem was put on this earth. And on this earth it was corrupted. That's why there is a new Jerusalem. When it's trampled underfoot, those in Judea are going to flee into the mountains. Some will escape Jerusalem. But the Lord told us in the book of Daniel that while it's under siege, many people are going to die, but those in Jerusalem, right, some of them are going to be tried. Right, they're going to be tried. It's a process to make them white, even to the time of the end. They're going to be purged of evil, of all their stuff, because they're going to be under somebody else's thumb. They're going to change. And in so doing, God will have purged his people of sinful ways, of these pious ways. They'll be good to go. It's part of their washing, part of the process for them. That same process we undergo over the duration of our whole lives. Right? But in this case, Jerusalem, in Isaiah chapter 5, that's God taking care of his vineyard. He said he would do it. And in this case, Jerusalem is going to go through that process. They're going to go through. Now, at the end of that process, God clearly begins to fight against everybody on behalf of Jerusalem to let the world know he did not forget them. And he fulfills his covenant with her at the end. But they have to go through this process of correction, much like we did. Now, after this process of correction, then that prayer in Jeremiah comes to be, which is, Jerusalem will then be considered holy. And when she is holy, the rest of the world is healed. But here's the question, though, is does Jerusalem represent? Is all trade going to stop because of Jerusalem? Well, when you read in the Bible and it says, all idols are going to be hewn down. All nations, all nations, not some all nations, are going to go through this. When it says, all the armies of the earth are destroyed, Oh, boy. When it says that the inhabitants of the earth are few, they're few. That means all these nations are going to undergo a purging. Because people are going to have to undergo some horrific things. Now, those who belong to the living God, of course, we're going to go through some things, too. We've gone through some of it. We just can't see it. We've gone through trials and times that could have wiped away the entire earth. We're just too young to really, you know, put that into our daily life. We can't see it. But if you look at things as a whole, you're going to find out that the earth has been undergoing this massive change for a long time. Also, God promised that the kingdom of the beast would have its time to prosper in the earth. And at that time, everybody who was loyal to darkness is going to run to the kingdom of the beast. They'll be in one kingdom. They'll unify under one umbrella, that of the beast with his mark and number of his name. They'll all be thrust into darkness. When it says Babylon is burning, the Bible tells us that all these nations are going to do the same. So what happened? Here's what I believe about certain nations, like America. America's going to go through some correction. You better believe that. It's too corrupt. It is too corrupt. Everybody believes in their own ideas. And it's very difficult to see the truth. Because you had to weed through so many lies, so many things, the propaganda, and everything else. God's going to utterly uproot everything. When that happens, then, those who are sincere, after they're beaten down, trod down, and everything else... Anybody who believes in Christ who is still here on this earth, even new ones, are going to turn back to a pure way. That's what the Lord tells us. Things will be restored at that time. I believe this is one of the nations that helps Jerusalem and other countries defeat the beast. God will empower earthly elements over the beast. That's part of its darkness. You can read that in the book of Daniel. I believe that America is part of that reprieve. I do. Why? Because if the sinful portion of America is taken away, and all those people who support those sinful ways are taken away or changed, 
I believe this nation will rise up a very faithful element. That's what I believe. It'll rise up, but it's going to have to be purged first. And I believe what you see happening right now represents the finite portion of that process. I really do believe that. So, check this out. It says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and have lived it deliciously with it shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see her smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Now, here's the thing, though. Who would say Israel is a mighty place? Nobody. And Israel, is she a hub of trade? Well, a lot of trade goes through, yes. Gold, silver, things like that. But listen, who's the coordinator of all trade? Where's the real trade? Ah, where's it at? America, we know what we do. It's, it, listen, it, it is no secret that we are the only ally of Israel. We cannot separate ourselves fully from Israel. And whatever Israel undergoes, you better believe we're going to have a peace in it. When this country is ablaze, then I can see people looking afar off saying, Oh my goodness gracious, that mighty kingdom, the most powerful nation on planet Earth, is on fire. I can see people saying we lost everything. I can. But at the same time, what happens if we burn? Israel burns. Israel's going to burn too. If, if we burn, right, Israel's not going to just be nice. No. And if something happens in Israel, it's going to happen here too. What you saw Hamas do, don't you think for one moment that's not going to take place here. If Hamas decreed that upon Israel through international partners and support of the Middle East, you better believe there's a plan in the mix right now. You better believe it. We might want to wake up concerning those things. We are not in normal times. They have been trying for so many years to get and to take down the USA. Do you not know? It is in their book of faith to have us burn. Do you not know that? Their God will draw close to them if we burn. If they kill themselves, killing us. Their God is pleased with it. Do you know that? And nobody can attack Israel and get away with it so long as we are standing. So you might want to come to this realization right away. Something is going to happen in this nation. Is God going to stop anything from happening in this nation? No, because we're partaking of darkness. We're not doing things the right way. We're not. If I gave, if I talked to you guys about what I truly believe, you wouldn't listen to me anymore. We're not even being humane anymore. We're not. America last week is responsible for millions of people starving to death and dying. That was last week. We are responsible for that. The inhabitants of the USA are fighting each other. They're against each other. With this Democrat-Republican thing, there's nothing but raw hatred and darkness coming out of that on both sides. Period. There's no love in that discussion. And professionalism is quickly being lost. That's one big farce, is what that is. That's just tearing people to pieces. It has gotten so that you cannot speak your mind concerning what you think of things politically. Because if you start siding with one side or the other, you're going to gain enemies in the same talk. I have lots of enemies because I won't take a side. I have threats because I won't take a side. Well, Jimmy cracked corn on that. America. It's just like Israel, given a beautiful place, and what did we do? We did the same thing Israel did over and over again. Right now, we have so much grace and mercy and richness in this place, but men have become greedy, and they do not care about their neighbor. They get nervous about their money. They get nervous about their status, and they're trying to point their finger at everything, saying that's the cause, that's the cause, that's the cause. But they will not point at themselves, saying, I am the cause. You know, in, in a family, when you're looking at everybody in your family, you say, wow, they got to change. No, 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 no. If everybody has a problem in your family, then you better point to yourself and say, you need to change. You better go look in a mirror and say, you're the one that needs a change. We still don't get it sometimes. God did not put us in a paradise. You weren't born, born in a vial. God took a piece of himself to create you. That's why you believe. And he put you right in the middle of darkness. That's where he puts all of his lights. To shine that light. But something awful is happening. The same lights God put in the middle of vast darkness. They want to be just like the darkness. They want peace with the darkness. 
God didn't put you here to have peace with darkness. God put you here to destroy the darkness. Wherever light is, there can be no darkness. You know that, right? It's impossible for darkness and light to cohabitate. So, when the merchants of the earth, when they weep and mourn over her, this word her is more than... Now, we're talking about Babylon. We're not talking about mystery Babylon. We're talking about Babylon. There's a big difference between mystery Babylon and Babylon. Mystery Babylon is a place you would never think to, to, that's even like Babylon. That's what mystery implies. Hidden. Just like the mystery of iniquity. Hidden iniquity. That word directly translates into the word hidden. Hidden Babylon is when you have Babylon on the inside. And it does not show on the outside. Obvious Babylon are the kingdoms of this world. It already said, God said, come out of her, my people. So guess what? God's people, you, me, we live in Babylon. The kings of the earth live with her. They're in her too. You, you start to see those uh, descriptions? Her sins have reached unto heaven. Is that not the whole world? Is that not the entirety of the earth? And when the merchants of the earth behold all the nations ablaze, they're going to say it's over. Finally happened. That word, that, that alas, alas, that's when they say it finally happened. I knew it was going to happen. When, it, to say alas means you have a, you know it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. When you say alas, alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. That's the whole world. That's when people are standing in the USA. It's when people are standing in Russia. It's when people are standing in China saying, I knew it was coming. And here it is. Finally heard that the time has come. Huh? Can you see that? Can you see people standing in the earth period saying we knew it was coming, but finally it's here. It's here. That when they say alas, alas, that means finally, finally it's here. That means you expected that to happen. You didn't know when it was going to happen. And they say it's here. The great city Babylon. Now, we're talking about Babylon, so they're saying the great city Babylon. Of course, in the book of Daniel, Babylon is what? The entire earth. The, the great city Babylon, that mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. The merchants of the earth. Now, it's a known fact that all the merchants of the earth do not have deals with the USA. They don't. It's a known fact that all the merchants of the earth don't have deals with Israel. They don't. This says all the merchants of the earth. No exclusions, which means when it finally takes place, they're going to say, no more income from that. All business is ruined. It finally happened. It finally happened. See, because people suspect. You guys look for it every single day. You know something is going to take place. You just don't know when. And when it does happen, I can tell you this. People will say that very thing. It finally happened. It's going to be all over the earth. Let me, get, let me give you guys something real quick. You know when Revelation, when it says... The sky departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. I remember looking at that, and I heard somebody say one time, they said, well, that's a nuclear explosion, a mushroom cloud. Plausible, but just not quite it. Doesn't quite fit. I can see if they say, you know, it rolled together on all sides. Up to one point, that, that'd be it. But I don't see that. Now, let me share something else with you guys. What other, what other thing, what other case, what other instance can cause the sky to separate like it's being rolled together. Not rolled apart, but rolled together. You ready? Listen, on water, you got a speedboat. When you're under the water, underneath the water, and you see a speedboat pass. The waves, the water separates by the waves rolling together. In the air, when the space shuttle program was alive, right? Sometimes it was cloudy. And you can see the jet stream of the shuttle coming down into the atmosphere. Sometimes it would go through clouds something interesting happened. It would rip the clouds in half, rolling them together on both sides. Somebody says vortex, vortices on both sides, aerodynamics, fluid dynamics, 101. So, there's a bigger model of that. If a body in space were to skim our atmosphere, and when I say skim, not touch the Earth, but to come in proximity that it would affect the pressure greatly of the upper atmospheres, guess what would happen? You would see a blackness as the sky departed and the clouds got caught in horizontal vortices as it passed. That's what you would see. You would see the sky open up and it would look just like somebody's rolling together scrolls. 
and it will leave nothing but blackness in its wake. And you know what? We're on schedule for that. We're on schedule for that. There's no doubt in my mind that's exactly what we're going to have. That'll help you out a little bit because I'm telling you again, what's happening here? When the merchants of the earth are going to weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Let me read that again. Let me read that again. Standing afar off for fear of her torment. That means getting away from everything. That's exactly what a person would do. Saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buy their merchandise anymore. Oh, whose merchandise? Whose merchandise are they not going to buy anymore? The merchants of the earth. Let me read that one more time. It's right here in front of you. Revelation 18, 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Whose merchandise? The merchants of the earth. No merchants of the earth are going to have merchandise anymore. This is a global event. Let's continue. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk, scarlet and all thy wooden manner of vessels and ivory and all manner of vessels and most precious wood and brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. That's everything. Everything is over. And the merchants of these things, miss one, and the fruits of the, and the fruits that thy soul us and after departed from thee, and all the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them no more at all. Now, if you can't find something no more at all, it didn't designate say no more at all in that place. It said no more at all. That's period. You're not going to find this stuff period again. It's over. It's over. It's done for. Sayonara. It's finished. The whole earth is going to endure this. You remember what da Babylon, what uh, Daniel said? Before the final kingdom, before that, everything is going to be destroyed. All the ways of the earth are going to be put down. No one will keep their ways in the earth. No one. Remember in the book of Isaiah, it said the earth is in ruin. Remember that? You guys remember that? Watch this then. Continue. On one hour, so great riches is come to naught or nothing. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. No wonder. The safe place to be would be on the water, in a boat. If something global like this happened, that would truly affect all the land masses, they're going to be burning on fire. They are. That could be part of the meteor storm. That's a seven-year storm, and that's not a joke. That means big rocks from space slamming into the ground for about a seven-year period, seven to eight-year period. That's a long time in it. What you should know, nothing's going to survive that. It's going to start too many fires. And everybody should know how deadly fires truly are. Can you imagine that all over the face of the earth? This meteor storm is not going to pass through and it's gone, though. It's a seven-year storm. Listen, the optics see this storm as being so far out there, you can't even track. You, you can, they can only track about, I believe it was three quarters of the bulk of the storm and it still comes behind it. So that means there's a lot of debris that we're going to pass through. See, it, think, of the, think of the rings or the arms around the galaxy, right? And our solar system is going to pass through a very dusty part of that. Well, that dust happens to be rocks, and we're headed right for it. And we're going to pass through that arm. It is two million miles wide. We're not going to miss it. That's the width of it. The length of it, you can't even estimate it because you cannot see the end of it. It looks like it goes to infinity. But it's an arm, right? It has curvature. That's why nobody can see past that point. But it is two million miles wide. Now, you could translate that to two million miles high and trillions of miles in width. We're not going to dodge a two million mile uh, 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 wave of rocks that in depth will last about seven years. That's not going to happen. Why is it going to last seven years? Because it's almost webbed as it goes around this galaxy. By the way, going around the galaxy, we go up and down and up and down and all around. That's what we do. We go up and down and up and down. We oscillate. Plus or minus. So many past that perfect point. We go up and down and up and down all the way around. We're going to smack into stuff. We're going to be in a place we've not been in before. Plus, we already have something touching our galaxy. That's what they need to share with everybody. 
something is touching our galaxy. It is not going to be good. It's not going to be good, but it's coming. Let's continue. So it says, for one hour so great a riches has come to nothing, and every shipmast and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood far off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? By the way, look up that word city, please, and you'll find it's not the city you were thinking about. Look up that word city and you will understand it. The Greeks used, they were, they were extremely, they put everything in categories, right? A city is never a city, not in this context, if it's empty. You're looking at inhabited land masses. These have to be inhabited places for it to be this type of city. Now, they did get the Bible to us, but in a lot of cases they condensed the language. You can now go back and look and see exactly what they were talking about. Just be careful not to add what you think is in there. Add it in there according to context like the Greek language is structured. And you'll begin to find it. Let's continue. They cry when they saw the smoke were burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Or, that's just like us saying, Whose time is like our time? Who could build a world? We use that word world like they use city. Oh, this is a beautiful world. And we use that word world to describe what we have done. We say we have built a beautiful place. What are we talking about? The world. We're not talking about somebody's backyard. The word earth, likewise. Same thing. So see, if somebody analyzed our language, they would have a hard time deciphering, you know, what world went, meant, what earth meant, what city meant, what time meant, all these things. Because we're, we don't categorize things like the Greeks. They did. And in this case, city is more like saying the world or inhabited places. It's also plural and not singular. Let me continue. They cried when they saw the smoke of the burning, saying, What city is like unto this city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city, wherein we were made rich, all that had ships in the sea, by reason of our costliness. All that had ships in the sea, not some, all that had ships in the sea. So what are we talking about here? It's like the land masses are highly damaged. People are surviving on ships, and they're looking, and all the landmass is saying, it's over. We had a good time. We had a good go at it, but it's all done now. And they're crying, not happening, but their life is over too. They have no function. There's no job for them anymore. All those container ships out there, no job for them anymore. All the factories blown up. All the ports gone. All the everything gone. Nobody to sell it to. It said there's no one to sell it to. There's no merchandise left at all. This is another one of those telltale scriptures. And listen, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein we were made rich, all that had ships in the sea, by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. There it is. God hath avenged you on her. In her was found the blood of the prophets. And of the saints, we read that in Revelation, what, 16. In who was found the blood of the prophets? The sinners of this world. The sinners of this world killed the prophets. In the Old Testament, things started out as a place. In the New Testament, they became what they were prophesied to be. I'll say it again, Babylon, in the book of Daniel, Babylon, that dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, he saw four kingdoms. He was the head of gold in the first kingdom. Another king was inferior to him, and yet another, and the fourth kingdom was partly strong and partly weak, iron and miry clay. Those are four kingdoms. King Nebuchadnezzar had dominion over all the earth, so did the fourth kingdom. Of the whole world it had dominion. It was, it was the whole earth. The final kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. The final kingdom is coming. The final kingdom will have rule over all the earth. Until that time, until the final kingdom is here, King Nebuchadnezzar was the standard, the head of gold, and he had rule over all the earth. Then the other inferior kingdoms came, but they still had rule over all the earth. It specifically states they had rule over all the earth. Now, when we're talking about a kingdom, all these nations, right? Think of them as a kingdom, one kingdom. The kingdom before the everlasting kingdom. Think of all of them as one kingdom. The world and people of the earth, by their translation, they see it as many different kingdoms. We've got to be careful not to let the world decipher the word of God for us. Can't do that. 
because Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke that the world does not have the truth. We got to be careful not to let the world. They can't decipher this word for us. They can't discern this word for us. They can't interpret this word for us. That must be spiritual. Or it's not done at all. In the Bible, it says the word must be discerned spiritually, understood spiritually. If it's going to be understood spiritually, it's going to be understood by the truth of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone. Not by flesh, not by reasoning, not by any of those things, but by the Spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. God wants us to have the truth, the one truth. The truth of God is one truth, not twelve. It's one truth. That's why I don't care about my own opinion and what I think in this and the other. I want the Lord's truth, not my own. That's why I make a distinction. I'll say, I'll tell you what I think, but that's just what I think. You can throw that in the garbage can. The Lord wants us to know the truth. He didn't want us to know what I think, what I have deduced. Who cares what I think and what I have deduced? And we can have that truth. We can have that truth, but it does not come by these carnal faculties we're born with. It won't come that way. And the world certainly does not have it. So listen, when you start talking about kingdoms, don't let the world define what a kingdom is for you. They don't know. That's why these common words, the world says they're true, but something in your spirit says that's not it. You ever have that? I have that all the time. That's not it. That's incomplete. That's not the truth. And whenever I get something like that, that's why I can only tell you what I think. I'm not going to sit here and tell you what God's truth is because I think it's his truth. No. When I have God's truth, I'm going to know it everywhere in my body and everywhere else. When you have God's truth, you don't jump, you don't say it. You live it. It becomes a part of you. You can't separate from it. Now, let's continue. These folk cast dust on their heads because their life was over. And then it says, it says, after this, they cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, great city, wherein we were made rich, all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she has been made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven. Now, let me, let me give you this. What was promised to be destroyed in one hour? God already said it. God said, I'll do it in one hour. Let me paraphrase. This will make you hunt. God will destroy all the idols of this earth in one hour. In one hour, he'll destroy every idol in this earth. Write that down. Every idol he'll destroy in this earth in one hour. That'll make you do your homework, and when you find it, you'll be blessed. That's going to open up a lot for you, because it goes a lot further than that. But God will destroy every idol on the face of this earth in one hour. One hour. He's going to do away with every single one in one hour. He said the whole earth was filled with them. He's going to destroy them in one hour. Let's continue. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Now, there's something you see here. In God's vengeance, you start seeing the same declarations he made unto Jerusalem. You do. In God's vengeance, you start to see some of the same declarations he made to Babylon. He's telling you more and more about the fallen state and the redeemed state of the exact same place. We see the Lord doing something here. He's only going to destroy the sinful part. That's it. That's all God's doing here. He's only going to destroy the sinful part. He will never harm the righteous part. That's what you see happening. God destroying the sinful part. Right here, there's an emphasis on the merchants of this world and all the fine merchandise because let's go ahead and face it. People try to get rich and they will kill you doing it. Families separate over the jealousy of money and power. Greed, all sorts of stuff is born of that. And this dumb competition. But in the world, competition is necessary or the money system falls apart. You know that, don't you? It's called capitalism. It is necessary or the money system falls apart. So what man did was develop a flawed system. And competition is an intimate part of it. That means someone has to suffer in order for someone to be victorious. Listen to me. Every time Satan influences anybody to construct anything, it will cost lives to prosper in it. God does not work that way. When the Lord builds something, it is clean and all prosper. When Satan builds something, you have to give your fellow man the beat down to be comfy. He requires that you murder. According to the word of God, you're going to have to murder to make it in his kingdoms in that stuff he's built. 
You'll have to live like Sodom and Gomorrah to make it. What motivates half these people to get up? More money. And when they get more money, they buy more stuff so they can make more money. It's a trap. They stay tied up like that all their lives and then they die. Somebody else takes up the same thing and they go living with it. So in essence, the world lives with an idea and they pursue that idea with the backing of money because money is instant power it makes them believe that the whole dream is real, but it's not. If somebody handed you a million dollars, you're empowered in the world. That is proof to you that you can be instantly empowered. And so you will begin to chase that too if you didn't belong to the living God. You would say, ooh, I have to be empowered even more. And that's what wakes the world up, to be empowered. The Lord's children should never operate that way. We started out that way. We are not to continue that way. Somebody said one day, they said, yeah, it's rough because you need money. Yes, you do. To live in this world, to live in Satan's kingdoms, you need money. If these were God's kingdoms, you would not need it at all. Let me give you another example. Before somebody says, well, you really don't need money if you can trust God enough. Okay, well, you really don't need food either, do you? You can be supernaturally sustained. You don't need food or water, do you? Wrong, because God put you here in a physical form. To do what? To affect the place you're in. He put you right in the middle of darkness. To partake of what they partake of. To do what? To destroy the works of darkness. You were born in the enemy's camp. This is not your home. But you are among the enemy. And the Lord said, what? Love your enemy. Oh, man. How, how much did he have to describe what he did? He stuck you right in the middle of darkness. In a place called Babylon. Now, let me highlight something. Somebody asked, they said, how does the woman ride the beast? Show me in the Bible where the woman rides the beast. Can anybody show me where the woman is riding the beast? Anybody. If I'm not mistaken, that's artwork, right? Just artwork. It's a people interpretation. To sit atop the beast and to ride the beast are two different things. So the woman sits atop the beast. Why is she sitting atop the beast? Because she lives in the place where the heads of the beast surround her. And the beast hates her. The beast does not like her. Let me tell you something. If the beast is the devil, then the woman is not who you thought she was. Because the beast hates the woman. Though she is a harlot. Because she's sinful. But let me tell you something. That woman still belongs to the living God. And you're seeing her sinful condition. That's what you're saying. But she belongs to the living God. And her sinful state will be burned. And her flesh will be eaten. But Satan does not like her. Satan will never defeat Satan. Didn't the Lord teach us that in the New Testament? That's why he said a house divided against itself shall not stand. Because they said to Jesus, you're casting out devils by the devil. And Jesus said, what kind of logic is that? That's what he said. So let me further emphasize this to you. The woman is found. You might as well picture her curled up, bruised, lying in the dirt. And the, and the beast is surrounding her, ready to devour her. Not like they described this on this artwork. Because the artwork misrepresents what the Bible even teaches. The woman is not holding a sword riding atop some seven-headed beast as foolishness. This woman is found within the seven mountains, the seven hills, which are the seven heads of the beast. And the beast hates this woman. But this woman is a harlot. This woman has sin on her. And God's going to allow the beast to destroy the sinful part of her. And the dodo beast doesn't even realize what he's being used for. Because when he destroys the sinful part of this woman, the redeemed woman is untouched. Is still under a covenant. Will never be, she'll never be touched by uncleanness. And she will descend from the heavens to earth. Satan has no idea what he's doing. But you can. You just can't believe by the world's interpretation. The Lord has an everlasting covenant with Israel. Read Ezekiel 16, and despite her rebukes, despite the disgusting descriptions, despite what she did, the Lord God says, he'll deal with her as she has done. But he said, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee, 
in the days of thy youth, and I will establish thee an everlasting covenant. He'll not forget her. He never will. And he will restore her. Because you can read again in the Bible, when Jesus shows up, they'll say what? Who put these holes in your hands? And he'll say, my friends did this to me. See, they still didn't know him. But the Lord embraced him, and he said at that time, they will be his people, and he will be their God. So if he's going to be their God at that time, that's when they recognize him as such. Which means right now they're having issues with it because they were made blind so that we could make it in. God said he would not make a full end to her. So when they go in and do what they got to do, her redeemed state is saved. Listen, when we are redeemed, the majority of us has to be destroyed. We're given a born-again spirit, which is small, not big, and then it grows as we search out the living God, as we continue to feed upon his word, it grows. We're undergoing the same process. Some of you can overcome certain things in the earth. God will overcome them for you in your fullness. Isn't that awesome? So that means there are certain things here in this earth you may not be able to get over. But Jesus, he's the one who said, God will finish the work he began in you. He is the author and finisher of your faith. You do not write the last chapter. Your Father in Heaven does. You don't even close the book. Your Father in Heaven does. You didn't write the first page. Your Father in Heaven did. You can do all sorts of things in between. But God will finish your book. And He said it that at the end of that book, you are victorious in Him. That's why. Not by being pressured, but by love you follow the Lord. Not trying to meet everybody's mandate, but by truth, you walk after the Lord. Stop walking behind Christ with heavy feet. Understand what he has done for you. Walk with joy. Somebody says, I feel lost. I say, good, because now you can be found. Nobody can be found when they already know where they're going. Now, can they? It's only when we get lost that we say, I don't know what I'm doing. Somebody help. And the Lord can actually help. He cannot help. When your strength is high, he can't do that. That's why the Bible says, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Why? Because in your weakness, you won't interfere. Because in your weakness, you stop come, trying to come up with all these, I, well, I did. I, I didn't have any more harebrained ideas. And I was guided. And when you're guided, that's when you experience God's perfectness. That's when his strength overcomes all. And you don't even know how. That's when you find yourself out of your trial, just like when they got into the storm. See, a lot of people don't know this part either. When they were in that boat in the storm, right? Do you not know that after he fed all those people, when they were in that boat, how did they get to the other side? Did they just roll over there? No. They found themselves on the other side. They didn't even perceive they were at the other side. The boat went boom, and they were right there. And the people on the other side said, how in the world did y'all get here so quickly? You see, the Lord finished he fit. They were in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a storm. And before they knew it, they were already on the other side, which everybody said was impossible. Nobody understood how they could have gotten there so fast. What is that an example of? When you're in that crisis, that storm, when you have no more ideas because they were f afraid. And the Lord said, don't be afraid. I'm with you. They were afraid. When they relented, when they ran out of ideas, when the sails were not doing right, and the rudder broke, they couldn't even steer. Guess who brought them to the other side? The Lord. He does it every single time. His strength is made perfect when we stop interfering because we can't do anything else. So the person that says, I'm lost, then good. That's a good beginning because you're meant to experience the deliverance of the Lord. If you guys would turn to 1 John chapter 3, please. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world did not know God, so it's not going to know you. Behold now, we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. 
And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Did you see that? So his purpose is clear to take away our sins. That was his purpose. That's why it was made manifest. To take away our sins. That means, number one, there's an acknowledgement. We had sin. He came to take away our sin. How many have sin in their life right now? Because if you do, he has come to take away that sin. If any one of us say we have not sinned, well, we're not truthful. God is doing a work here through Christ. And Jesus is that element of work that is removing sin from us. Now, take note, it didn't say he came, obliterated sin. It's all over. That's it. But no, that's not it. He came. This is a process. He came to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Listen, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. That's pretty heavy, huh? Whosoever abideth in him, stays in him, they don't sin. So what is our problem? We don't stay in him. That's our problem. But before you go and do this self-condemnation thing, he already knew that, which is why he teaches and encourages. He already knew that. All that's being worked out. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that it might destroy the works of the devil. Now, if anybody asks you, why did Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil and to remove sin from us? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are made manifest. Now, that's a process. To be made manifest is a process. And so here's what happens. You start out a scoundrel, full of ways you don't even know yet. You stay in the Lord. First, you follow him. You seek to be in him more and more every single day. Finally, you step foot in the Lord. In that moment, you have no desire for sin. And as Paul said, if you do sin, it is no longer you that sin, but the flesh. In other words, you have no desire for it. So how can you have no desire for sin, and you yourselves are not engaged in sin, but yet you may have sin? How does that happen? If I were to step into a place, and, and possibly you conversate with the wrong person, and the wrong point is taken, many would see that as a sinful thing, but you didn't try it. That was not your intention. You did not do that. It just came out that way. So you're good to go. Let's say, for example, that you're talking with a person, they take it the wrong way. They start crying because you highly offended them. You feel bad because you did so. But you did not intend to do that. It was taken that way. It's another case. Let's say also you choose to do something terribly and sinful. Well, I'll tell you in that moment, guess what? You stepped out of Christ. You didn't stay in him. And when you step out of Christ, you already know what you have stepped into. There is no in-between. You're either in or out. And the Lord encourages us in another place in the Bible to remain in him, which means he already knows. He already knows that in our weakened state, we do things we shouldn't do. But he said, never forget, sin has a penalty. But sin removed is a blessing. It is a gift. Better to have sin removed than to have the penalty of sin. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, somebody asked this last night, Cain was of that wicked one. How so? By way of his spirit. He, he, he was totally eaten up by flesh in worldly ways, doing things like the world, this, that, and the other. And wherefore slew him, because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. That happens every single time. When you step into righteousness, first of all, whatever you do is going to be scrutinized and noticed. Notice how whatever you do is not noticed of the world when you're not, when you have not stepped into righteousness, right? As soon as you step into righteousness, you're going to have a whole crowd of people who will tell you how you're going to fail. Just remember that. He says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Marvel not that the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. If you don't love your brother. The only way you cannot love your brother 
is because you are in death itself, not in life. See, those who are in life itself, in the love of God, they hope for love and life for somebody else. Those who are in death have a habit of wanting it for everybody else. Whatever you're in, what, wherever you are, whatever state you're in, you're going to hope it upon everybody else. Hereby, perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we all laid down our lives for the brethren. He laid down his life for us. Nobody else laid down their life for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. For us. Nobody else. Jesus did. Right? So we know in that way that his, he is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men, and he laid down his life for us. Listen. But whoso hath this world's goods, whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? See that? You will not withhold your hand from your own flesh. When the love of God is in you, you have compassion for all you do. But if a person close down that portion of himself, to say, well, they shouldn't have got themselves in that predicament, or, or something of that nature, right? To close yourself off to a person, have no compassion for somebody, means you have, again, stepped out. Stepped out of the love of God. Here's a fact. We didn't deserve it, but the Lord gave his life for us anyway. We did not deserve it. All of us deserve death. But he gave his life for us. Let's continue. My little children, let us not love in the world, word let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and truth let me say that again my little children let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and in truth you know what that means does the lord love us in deed and in truth yes he does how do we know this you're not dead because you believe in christ because despite our foul thoughts we still occupy and are growing spiritually because every commandment he gave us, he is and does exercise towards us. We were once his enemies. Anytime we were in sin, we were against him. Yet he loved us. So here it says, that it's not love in tongue or in word. That's when you tell somebody you love them all the time, da -da 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 -da, but nothing ever happens. So what is he saying? If you don't love someone in word, if you don't love someone, you know, like that, then how do you love a person, he says, in deed and in truth, not in word or in tongue, not by speech or in some letter, but in deeds and in truth. Why? Because, because when you love someone by deeds and by truth, when you do that, and you're not saying a thing, guess what you're doing? You're helping that. You're, you're a part of why that person is sustained, why that person continues. Now, that's real love. Real love is not some communication. Real love from God to us is not saying, not him telling us he loves us all the time. No, real love from God to us is his sustainment. You should be dead by now. The Father has stopped so many things from killing you. The, but when we don't see it, we act like he didn't do anything. And God's love, but here's the deal. If God loves you, who can prove that God loves him? Let, let, let's be truthful. Here, here's the truth. God loves you, yes. Many of you have gone through many years of dryness. You said, I'm lonely. You said, nobody is there. You said, I'm dying. You were ready to quit, hang up the towel, and do everything else. And all the while, God loved you before you ever came to this earth, while you were living on this earth, and he will love you still. But you did not perceive it. Do you know why? Because you could not see it. When love is seen, that's a true blessing. But don't you ever forget something. Love goes out. It will accomplish it's not going to return void. It works. It will help you. It has helped you. So when you feel like you're alone and nobody's doing anything, stop doing that. Because your father loves you. How many people thought the father was not there? That was absolute blasphemy. Because he has been there. But people don't perceive it. You don't perceive it all the time, do you? Why? Because love is understood at the end. Not in the middle. Not at the beginning. It's understood at the end. Love is fully understood at the end. There's only a hint in the middle or at the start. It is fully understood at the end. We do not understand all things of our Father in the middle. We thought he wasn't there for many times in our lives, but we will perfectly understand it at the end just like he said we would. At the end he said that, not in the middle, at the end. 
We have to be taught how to see the love of God. And God loves us more than anybody else could. Yes, he does. So listen to me carefully. I had this talk a few days ago, ladies. Just because you don't perceive it, don't, don't you dare say somebody does not love you because you can't see it. Stop doing that. Gentlemen, don't say your other half does not love you because they didn't do what you wanted. Stop doing that. Your father is the perfect example of love, and you cannot see his love, though his love is made manifest in seasons, isn't it? All of this is to say humanity does not know what love is. God is love, and for anybody to say they know what love is, and they know exactly what God is, because God is love, and it cannot be separated. Love is a touchy subject because God is love. There is no other love but God, and there is no other God but God. Remember that. These ideologies in the world called love is foolishness at best. And it does nothing but break people. God's love does not break people. It saves people. It redeems people. It unifies. It reunites. It quickens. It fulfills. There is no shortcoming in God's love. So we as human beings have to stop thinking somehow. We know what it is and we're experts on it. We are not. We are discovering what that is. Please remember that. Let me continue. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And thereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before men. Did you guys hear that? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby, when you love in deed and in truth, hereby we know that we are of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before men. Here's why. Because when you know what you have done, when you know that you what you have done for somebody else, and somebody else say, well, you didn't do anything, you're not going to be heartbroken. You're not. Because you know what you did. Do you hear me? So let whatever you do be done in truth. Not for marketing. Not for cheese points. But in truth. And when it's challenged, you will know what you did. You will know. And it says right here, this is how you assure your hearts before men. That's how you assure your hearts before men. This is almost a telltale scripture that people are going to challenge your deeds of love and your love bound in truth always. That's what it means. So when they do challenge it, when you have your love bound in deeds and in truth, your heart will not crumble when somebody says you didn't do anything. It's almost like around the holidays, right? If a kid wakes up, and in truth, you didn't get them a present. They said, well, you didn't get me a present. Your heart's going to just crumble. But if you got them a present, they just can't see it yet. And they said, well, you didn't get me a present. It's not going to bother you at all. You know why? Because you know that you know that you got them a present. So with love, when you love someone, when you have done things for someone, right? And you know you have done things for that other person. And you did so in the truth. When they say, well, you didn't do anything. Your heart's not going to crumble. You're going to be stationary. You will not shake, waver, or anything else because you know what you did. Just let whatever you do be done in truth. You may, okay. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. Uh-oh. If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. How many are condemned in their hearts? How many, how many times have we condemned ourselves in our hearts? True, honestly. How many times have we said to ourselves, you know, I'm a raggedy something, something. I don't deserve life, and I should just be flushed down the toilet. How many times have we said something like that? How many times? You know, the word is telling you, stop doing that. Because here it says, if your heart does not condemn you, then you have confidence towards Christ. So the missing elements is to build up your confidence towards Christ. And how do you do that? Let me tell you something. Can I tell you something? You can tell yourself what you are all the time because you know that you know you did not do what you could that's where it comes from when you do not do what you're able to do that's when you condemn yourself so let me tell you this when you do what you're able to do and you do that thing in truth you will never condemn yourself the problem is we get a little lazy sometimes don't we don't just tell the truth we get a little lazy which means you could have done it but you didn't you could have done it, but you didn't. You let something stop you, 
you, you could have done it, but you didn't. And when you did it, sometimes you do something under the strain or stress or the push of other folks. That's not done in truth. When you do anything in truth, it is done from your heart. If somebody is pushing you to do it, that's not done in truth. That's done out of pressure. That's not going to help you. When you do anything in truth, when you do all of what you can do, you'll never condemn your own heart. And the Bible says, having done all you can do to stand, stand therefore. See, because when you do everything you can do, and you have done so in truth, you're going to stand like iron saying, uh-uh, I did everything I could possibly do. And you'll stand firm and you will never fold. Do you hear me? That's how you stand. We condemn ourselves when we take shortcuts. We condemn ourselves when we get too lazy and we don't want to do something and we could have done something. So the advice here is to do what you can do. Do it in truth, not for show, not because you were pressured. Do it in truth and you will have confidence towards God never condemning yourself. That starts a massive change in life. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. Isn't that awesome? It says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Uh-oh. So if you stop condemning yourselves and do all of what you can do in truth, you won't condemn yourselves. And then whatsoever you ask, here it comes. Why would I ask of the Lord anything when I'm not actually doing all I can do? I shouldn't expect to receive anything, and for the most part, none of us do. We'll pray sometimes. We won't receive it. We'll say, well, that's because I didn't do this. I could have done more, but I didn't. So, I see, you know, don't, but stop doing that, he's saying. See, the truth is, God wants to answer your prayers. He has a desire to answer your prayers. He has a desire to do that miracle in your life that nobody expects. He has a desire to give you good things. The problem is us. We will not, we sometimes will not do what we're able to do. God's not asking you to do what you're not able to do. He's asking you to do something out of truth. That doesn't do anything for him. That does everything for you. Because when you exercise out of your heart those good things that you're able to do, that's when you become like iron. That's when you become a pillar. That makes you honest. Do you know that? At the beginning of this conversation, with well, this short part, I said that sometimes we, we go back into sin because we that's what we want. This will stop you from going back into sin. When you start to do things out of truth for the living God, it breaks that habit of going and venturing into sin. Then you'll continue to abide in Christ. Again, we don't abide in Christ always because we desire the sin over him. Let's go ahead and face it. You all see that? And then whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Thank you, Lord. See that? We do those things that are pleasing in his sight. When what, though? When we do, by the truth of us, what we can do. And in this, his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave his commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know, hereby we know, he abideth in us by the Spirit, by the Spirit which he hath given us. Every single last one of you who believe in Christ, there are choices we make in this world. But be cautioned in the world of vipers. Vipers, God has given you dominion over to crush their heads. But you must be in righteousness for that to be true. To abide in Christ is an honest stance. A stance of integrity. And do you not know for a time? You know, because when you see Christianity and things like that, sometimes you just follow the tradition. You do what everybody else does. I learned quickly and early that wasn't the way for me. It wasn't working. All that was doing was nothing. But I don't like nothing. I wanted something because I actually believed. And when I did that, nothing came. Not zero. Nothing. To emulate or to join in with the crowd, do what they do, nothing came, nothing. When I stepped in for real, I mean for real, for real, that's the only time fulfillment came. When I stepped in for real, I stopped. I, it wasn't for show. It wasn't for show or anybody. It wasn't for anybody. No. It was intimate. It was me coming clean with Yahshua. It was me stepping in to Yahshua. It was me in agreement with the gospel. 
It was me casting down everything I thought I knew that I may adopt the truth. I did not want the dumb knowledge I had. What I thought, what I inferred, my wisdom and this and the other threw all that away. I said, Lord, you got to feed me because I'm empty. See, I felt empty. Despite the degrees, despite everything, I felt empty. Empty, 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 empty. And I needed the Lord's truth. When I tasted that food, I began to fill up. No other food did me like that. In fact, everything else was nothing. The Lord's the only one that ever had food for me. He is the only one. And Lord knows, I've, I've listen, I've read lots of things out there. Nothing had a taste to it except for the word of God. But I'll tell you something. If you fall in line by reason of somebody else, you're not going to taste how good it is. When you do what somebody else does, it's like you sitting outside while somebody else is in a restaurant eating and you're acting like you're eating. That's not going to do anything. You can go and eat yourself. That starts with you opening up your Bible. That starts with you praying. That starts with you looking for things and searching. That starts by you asking the Lord for wisdom, not asking everybody on Facebook, on YouTube, and everywhere else. And you say, Lord, how do I get rid of this? That's how it begins. I didn't want the phony things. I didn't ask the Lord, well, Lord, how do I walk on water? Nope. I said, Lord, how do I stop with these attitudes? How do I destroy self-aggression? How do I end? any envy that may ever rise how do i purge any jealousy that could ever enter that's how it began i wanted that stuff out of me i found it to be dirty rotten and stinky i wanted it gone and i went to the word of god and the lord led me to his truth you see how i read the bible guys you see how i read it is it normal no probably isn't you're not normal either but you have to be you you can't be somebody else God sent you here to be you. And the moment, the moment anybody is authentic with the Lord, the moment anybody is ready to eat, that is, to read and believe his truth. My goodness, you're going to be fed. And when you're fed, it's going to be like eating the best burger or food you ever had. And somebody's going to come by and offer you rotten meatballs. You're going to say, no, thank you. You're not going to get mad or anything else. You just won't want it. That's what happens. And then at that point, you're never alone. One of the first things I realized was, I'm never alone. You don't even feel like you're alone. When you have it for real, it's impossible to feel alone. I know people hate when I say that, but I can't help it. It is true. It is impossible to feel like you're alone when you step into Christ for real. So listen to me. All you have to do with what you have, where you are right now, with that truth that you have in you, is honestly step into Christ. Don't step into Christ like you are clean. Don't step into Christ like you have massive positions. Stand before him as you are. The moment you say, Lord, here I am. If you're a thief, then say, Lord, here I am, the thief. If you're an adulteress, say, Lord, here I am, the adulteress. If you're a liar, say, Lord, here I am, the liar. I choose you. I believe in your gospel. That's what you say. That's the truth. When you say that, you're not hiding it anymore. You've let it open, and even devils, all the devils who tried to use that against you, start running away. Devils can only use what you seek to hide. You want to take away their power? Then step to Christ as you are, and pronounce it in your secret place, and they got to go. That way, when somebody comes back and says, Hey, but aren't you the one that dated so-and-so? You say, You have no idea. I wish you were that slight. It's much heavier. And then they'll go the opposite direction. I did that at a dinner table once. Somebody challenged me. They said, well, Mike, didn't you so-and-so back then? I said, you have no idea. That's the good part of it. And believe me, it was bad. But I told that person, that's the good part. Well, let me give you the whole thing. See, because your past becomes your story to salvation. When your past becomes your support for what the Lord did, devils run devils stick around to use your past as a weapon against you because they know you don't want anybody to hear it but when it becomes your testimony they've got to go so when somebody brings up the past and they think they're going to get one over on you say oh let me tell you all of it you have the good part let me tell you the details they have to run 
When it becomes your testimony, they have to go because they have no weapon against you anymore. Those of you with your families, you know that to be true. You know that to be true. In the Bible, it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You are meant to abide in that liberty. You can do that for real, but you must initiate it. All you have to do is step before him as you are. You already know who he is and how to get to him. But have you had that conversation with him? That truthful conversation. Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 